Well, if I do the intro, I don't want to end up accidentally saying some embarrassing shit like I did in 2016. Like, welcome to 2018. It's not even 2018 anymore. It's 2019. It's a new year. You messed up so many dates in that. No, that was the year that I did that. You're trying to tell me in 2016, you said welcome to 2018? No, I and said it, 2016. Fact, 2019? Well, the idea was that I was going to do this now. Anyway, welcome to the video. <laughs> Yep, yeah, uh, we're here, we're back. We're here, we're back as always. Hello, I'm Ducky. I'm, I'm Calvin. We played some games this year. I don't want to say that I played a lot of games this year. Comparatively to last year, I played a lot less. In fact, maybe among the years that we've done this, this may have been the least amount of games I've played in a year. That's interesting. I, I felt like I wasn't playing that many games, but the end of the year when I actually had to start stacking stuff up, I did kind of find it difficult and I had to push a few things out, so... Oh, if there's anything, making this list has been difficult, because my middle was close. Everything was so close in the middle. Alright, um, do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Absolutely not. I want to start because I'm ending this bad boy off. Alright, I will start with my number 10. You know, I love uh, music games, and everybody asks, you know, I play rock bands, like, do you play drums? And I'm like, well, yeah, I do. And they're like, well, do you play guitar? And I'm like, well, now I can say yes, because now I played Rocksmith. My number 10 is Rocksmith 2014. <clears throat> uh, that game is hard, because it's just playing a guitar to a real song. <laughs> and that's it. That, all, all you have to do is think about, wow, they actually made that like accessible in game form. And uh, you ever have a day where you're like, well, I want to be productive, but I also want to play video games, but I want to feel like I got something done. That's why you play Rocksmith. Because you play a video game, and at the end you're like, wow, I'm actually better at playing the guitar. It's definitely um, been pushing me to play the guitar more so than uh, if I hadn't had it. I, it does get kind of difficult to um, decide to hop in, but when I do, it's like, I impress myself, you know? And I'm glad about that. And I'm like, wow, I can actually do a little bit more than I thought I could. So, I really enjoy it. It's got some solid stuff. I uh, imported the songs from the first Rocksmith, so I got like a nice uh, nice library building up, but uh, it's nice, it's nice. And uh, they recently just uh, released movies by Alien Ant Farm, so I picked that up <laughs> so I could learn how to play that on guitar. <laughs> I think, I mean, it's been a while since I've seen you play a Rocksmith, but it was really incredible. I can't remember what song, I think it was Heart Shaped Box, where mm -hmm. you're just playing it, and of course when you play it, you've got your headphones in, because you know, you don't want to be playing this loud music while everybody's around, mm -hmm. especially with, I don't know what, how many error sounds <laughs> Rocksmith gives you. Maybe just as bad as Rock Band 2. <laughs> it's not It's not that bad, but you can usually just hear the actual error of your guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then you've got, you know, like the right note with a dissonant note, and it's like, ooh. Mm -hmm. But you were playing Heart Shaped Box, and it sounded like heart-shaped box, and it was amazing, because you're just playing through and we're like, whoa, dude, you're doing really good. You're like, wow, oh, thanks. Yeah. So that's the fun of it. I recommend it if you've always thought to yourself, I want to learn guitar, but you don't really have any structure, and you're not really sure how to start, because I think it could help, but it's very fun, and it's got a nice dynamic uh, difficulty to it. So. Rocksmith 2014, very good. When are you going to get the platinum for that? <laughs> Probably when I learn how to actually play Green Grass and High Tides, which they also just released as DLC. I'm like, get out of here. Alright, well, my number 10, actually five years ago, this is actually the fifth time we've done this. Isn't that amazing? That's wild. Isn't that crazy to think about? That's wild. So, five years ago when we did this, I included one game on there that I ended up playing really, 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 really late in the year. And I was like, oh man, I gotta include this, this is so fun. And in the end, I ended up not playing it any more than that. <laughs> that game was Blur. Yep. Blur is the real fun, arcadey, racy game. And as we've said a lot of times, we do not have enough arcadey, racy games out there. Mm -hmm. So, the free game for PlayStation <laughs> in the month of December <laughs> is Onrush. <laughs> Onrush is a game where they said, you know what people really like just destroying each other in the middle of races? What if we just take out the race part? 
<laughs> what if we just make it that you're driving in a circle in the middle of trees with all these obstacles where you flip in the air and you can fly and the whole goal is to destroy random cars that spawn. Sometimes it's like a survivor where you have three stages and you start with a bike and then you have a car and then you get to a big car and the last team with the third stage person wins. It's not like you're eliminated, yeah. because then the other person gets to just try and play spoiler for the other team <laughs> once they're out. And it's just so amazing to see this game where it's like, oh, just destroy people. Hmm. Have a good time. It'll be fun, you know? I'd say, if anything, my one problem with Onrush is because of this circular thing and the idea is that it's not a race, so people aren't shooting ahead falling behind because when you yeah. crash you just spawn right there i would say it's number 10 and i've had a really good time playing it because it feels a little bit like it plays itself <laughs> and in some ways it's like your teammates do really well because i think it's always a six on six yeah so what will happen is your teammates will do well and sometimes you feel like you are boosting uh -huh. to the maximum of your ability and you're still not catching that car <laughs> that is half a car length ahead of you. You're know, like, I, I just want to go just a little bit faster. I yeah. just want to slam this guy into a tree off the map. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is um, Since it's a racing game, I've fringe heard about I've seen some murmurings about it throughout the year. I guess, how are the actual driving mechanics? And do you think, if it's not a race, and it sounds like a lot of them are just kind of the same-ish objective in the same-ish kind of track... Do you think there's enough variety in it? I think there is, to an extent. Maybe not, like, the most. Like, Rocket League <clears throat> is just you <clears throat> playing soccer, and it always works, and it's mm -hmm. fantastic. I think Onrush can get a little old after a while, but I think what would be good is if you, me, and Matt maybe played it together. Yeah. Because I, I think it, it would be really fun if you get a bunch of people together <laughs> playing it and just being like, oh, let's team up and get this guy and make sure that we hit this boost the way we do. And it's there's ramps all over the place. And I think I thought it was real cute when I started playing it, but whenever you ramp and you start to do a barrel roll, it always measures exactly how much of a barrel roll you will need <laughs> and you'll land. And if you do it with way too much space and you just hit it way off the side, you'll do like three corkscrews. <laughs> and it's amazing because even in that, there's bikes and you think, well, why would you use a bike when there are cars? Yeah. But it's like, you can do tricks, you can do <laughs> flips. And then, it's not that necessarily it's impossible to wreck people. You can still rub people. You can influence somebody into, like, a tree. Yeah. Like, you clearly can't slam into them or you automatically, you're automatically off your bike. But you can, like, push people in midair and... Oh, uh, yeah, okay. You know, a lot of it's, like, since there are these huge jumps, a lot of kills are, like, you literally land on top of somebody and <laughs> auto-kill them and... Yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I like that they're doing something neat and different. I would say why that's why Onrush is on here, because it really is its own thing. I know I've spent all this time mentioning random other racing games, but it's like, <laughs> flat out 4, all I wanted to do was just destroy stuff. And this is that game, where it's like, you can race and destroy stuff, and nice. it's great. It's a well-functioning game, and I enjoy <laughs> it number 10, Onrush. Uh, pick it up, it's still within this month, if you have PS4, it should still be free for the month of December, so... You're really, really putting the Whoops. effort on you for having Whoops. to release this yep, video. Yep, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you picked it up. Hope you picked it up, because this game came out in the middle of this year, and I think it was still $50 retail cut to free for PS Plus. So I hope you picked it up this month. That's pretty good. Yeah, but if this video releases next month, make sure you check out Steep. That is the free game for January. Really? Yeah. Oh, uh-oh. Uh see you next year. <laughs> All right. My number nine is, I apologize to say, it is the other rhythm game on my top ten. And it's Beat Saber. Beat Saber is so much fun. And it's just very, very intuitive. It's been the game to get me to put on the VR and stand up in front of the TV more so than any other VR game. Because it's at some point, with I tried Doom VFR and I'm like, this is kind of cool and stuff. But after a while, I'm like, I don't really want to put in the effort to set this stuff up and move the couch over a little bit. I'll just play this other game that I've been playing. But with Beast Saber, it's like, it's got no competition, really, for me. It's like, I just want to schlice 
with both hands. And I think one of the things that I really liked about it, and this is kind of, makes you sound kind of like a dick, but it's like, I grasped it pretty early on. You know, after a few sessions, I could play songs on Expert and kind of keep up. And it had this, this really good satisfaction of I started it and I'm good at it. And so it's really easy for me to keep going. It was easier to play this over something like Rocksmith because I knew that if I go in, I was going to get some high score. And at the same time, I was like, burning calories. <laughs> so it's a really fun game. And the soundtrack is like good-ish. It's kind of got the amplitude degree of like the 2016 version of, it's got songs that are good and techno and electronic, but it's nothing that you know or recognize. They're working on some, some more stuff, and it's kind of a shame that I have it on PSVR because the song list is really, really limited, and if you were so fortunate to get it on PC uh, with like an Oculus Rift or a Vive, you can just play somebody mapped out the entirety of the first Shrek movie. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and it's like, well, I the longest song I got is six minutes. <laughs> How many calories do you think I would burn chopping away to Shrek? Chopping away to Hallelujah by Shrek Buckley? But that's what's good sometimes, is when you're playing these rhythm music games and you're forced to listen to songs that you usually wouldn't, and then you discover something that you love that you wouldn't other than that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's all pop music, but it's like pop electronic. It's definitely not something you would hear, I guess, if you weren't playing Beat Saber or watching people play Beat Saber. I don't think you could ever hear, like, stumble across this sort of music, so. And I, I like it. I like it's all fresh, and I'm not, like, sick and tired of any of it yet. Great. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not hurt. That's okay. Um, Alright, well, I'm at number nine. Basically, this is what you want to hear from me, but I'd say out of my, probably my top eight were the games that I was like, <laughs> heck yeah. So, nine and ten, a little phoned in, because I was like, these are really, really good games. I love to talk about them, even though I've played them for... Not a lot of time. So you're saying 9 and 10 are as good as Happy by Pharrell Williams? Yeah, basically. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, my number 9 is Enter the Gungeon. Enter the Gungeon, yeah. What a fun game. Enter the Gungeon is a sweet, swell game. It is the modernization of Die Hard for the NES. <laughs> Except instead of being John McClane, you are, you know, little bullet guys. Little, little bullet, shoot. bullet... Bullet shooty people who shoot bullets. At bullets. Yeah, that also shoot bullets. This pun is not just to make the name. Everything is gun related in the yeah. game. Do you yeah. want a big shell that shoots shotguns? That's <laughs> that's a gun. <laughs> I really like the aesthetic is that you know, it's a pixel shooter, it's top down. And I really like that they rolled with that, you know, it's kinda like Crypto the Necro Dancer, where, you know, again it's pixel related, but they also really leaned into this theme that they got, but it's like Everything's gun related. The elevator that you use to go down is just a big bullet casing. And uh, all the enemies are bullet related. Well, maybe not all of them. Cause there's one that's just a big spider. That doesn't really <laughs> have anything to do with bullets. Um, it has something to do with dungeon. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Yeah, this game is hard. Hard is all heck. Oh my god. It, it hurts a lot. Uh, the only time I played it was on the Switch, which I've heard is ridiculous. My buddy back home, who has had it for the PS4, he said, he played it on Switch, he said, oh, this is a mess. In what way? <laughs> like, I wish I could just have my nice little PS4 controller. <laughs> you have everything in front of you. Play with the GameCube controller. <laughs> can you actually do that? Uh, you put your Smash know. thing together, Because I know, you pretend I know you it's can, like a pro controller? You can play, like, a lot of games with that, but you won't have an L1, which might be an issue. I don't remember what that does. Um, Maybe. Oh, that's just the extra dodge, so... I mean, if you use the face button for the dodge, then you don't even really need that button. Yeah, you can probably remap it. I'm gonna keep it at that, because again, played this like four months ago, <laughs> had a real good time on the couch, and thought, man, I wish I could play that more, and then I didn't. So I would 100% recommend Enter the Gungeon. I, I might be getting it this year, just so that I can play it some more. Cause... We'll see you again next year with <laughs> Enter the Gungeon still at 9. Yeah, well, maybe we'll move it up a little bit. <laughs> hey, Ducky. Do you like surprises? I do like surprises, especially when you ask me if I like surprises while I'm drinking coffee. Oh, I... I'm not sure how you're going to think of this surprise. Okay. My number eight is Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls. <laughs> surprise! Oh. Here's a short backstory. We tried to play this once, maybe three years ago. Yeah. And we played it for about 40 minutes. 
and it didn't really work out. And you no, know, you know why? You know why it didn't work out? What? I, I pinpointed it to one thing. We were both new at the game, and we were sharing one screen. So anytime anybody had to go in the inventory to look at their stats or buy something or equip something or sell something, which happens a lot in Diablo, the other person just has to sit there and wait. When you're not doing that, if you have your own screen, you have the freedom to adjust your stats and build out your loadout to what you think you would it would be without the fear of uh, wasting someone else's time. <laughs> so I played as a monk that had a spinning kick, like a roundhouse kick, and I dropped electric pillars on people, in addition to just having two daggers in each hand. So it is a lot of fun because it's kind of mindless, and Rowan and I had gone through and we beat the campaign, and we, we had gotten like our base characters to level 70, which is the max, but then there's like this 70 plus mode. And so <laughs> we started the game and we're, all, we're playing on like medium, and we're like, wow, we're just crushing these people. And then we look at the difficulty and it goes, easy, medium, hard, expert, master, and then torment one, torment two, torment three, all the way up to torment like 15 or something. So there's like 20 different like levels of difficulty and it's a weird game because it's got seasons and you can have a seasonal character that gets seasonal rewards. And I really don't know how that works. It's this interesting incentive to make a game that's, it plays kind of like Borderlands, you know, you run and you do your quests and there's a story, but it's like, whatever. It's really, it's this story of what all those like death metal albums are about. <laughs> it, you, you're just like, I don't really know what they're saying, but I kind of get what they're going for. Yeah. And it's just fun. You know, you're, you're just dashing to drop in the pillar. If you're Rowan, you have either seven skeletons following you around, or maybe just one giant golem that runs forward and explodes. <laughs> it's interesting, and I, I, I played Diablo 2 in the past, and this one plays a little bit differently. I'm assuming it's not just because we played it on PS4 and you have to do some things a little bit differently, but it's like, so much is building your character on lifesteal so you never have to really use potions. But of course you can if you want, and everything is just like a sort of regenerating game. It's like, uh, adjusting your skills, and it's like, well, I got a lot of this right now, and uh, like a lot of stamina, and every time I use one of these it gives me some health, so let me just drop like five pillars that are going to electrocute this, all these people in this huge group, and then I'll kick them. <laughs> and it's fun, it's, it's just goofy, good, good old fashioned, kind of mindless fun. I honestly believe that the reason it sucked the first time is because we didn't know what we were doing, and we were sharing a screen. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I'm glad you've come around. I don't think I'd probably come around. Boo. I think it's probably just not my kind of game, in part. And also, I can't come around. I'm a fervent Diablo hater. <laughs> I've been made to just hate on Diablo so Boo. much. Boo. It's 2018. It's not cool to be a hater anymore. <laughs> go, go, say your number right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good thing. Hey, welcome, welcome to my real list. <laughs> welcome to the good games. This is a top, a top eight <laughs> games of 2018. My good list. I had a really good start to this year. That's what was, probably helped a lot was that, I think I said it was the best start I ever had to a year, because mm -hmm. out of like the first seven games that I played, I think five of them are on here. <laughs> That's pretty good. Because it's just started so good. So my number eight is A, Hat in Time. Nice. I greatly enjoyed Hat in Time, and I think that I want to get that elephant out of the room right out of the bat. Last year, <laughs> I did not like Super Mario Odyssey. That's right. That much. It made it my honorable mention, but I said, you know, I just couldn't keep playing it. Uh -huh. And I have my own theory now about why that happened. And I just think that while Odyssey probably plays a little bit better than a hand time because a hand time is your kickstarter mm -hmm. blah 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 and, darling. and odyssey is still sixty dollars and i <laughs> guess i get that because you know now you've got all that dlc and people love it to death but what else are you gonna buy on the switch what else are you gonna buy on the switch other than brawl 3 <laughs> um what happens is i think mario and mario as a game and a story and a scope is probably one of the most limited artistic things at this point. Yeah. Where you can make the colors really pretty and mm -hmm. really fun, and you can do all these crazy things where you throw your hat into a frog and look, look, now you jump super high. Oh, it's real fun. You've 
made the mechanics fun. There's nothing really keeping you to that game. Uh-huh. Because you're just collecting moons. Once you get enough moons, you go farther. Like, the story in A Hat in Time is adorable uh -huh. and fun and surreal and you never know what's gonna come next, and that's what's the best thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From what it seems, and I haven't played Odyssey, and I also haven't played Hat in Time, but it seems like Hat in Time is at least more focused. The things you do tie into the actual overarching thing of the game a little bit more clearly. And I think to the point that you're making, and it's definitely something that I've felt too, it's like, sure, this this Odyssey game is, is new, and you're, you're in a city or whatever, you can throw your hat, but at the same time, I feel like I kind of know everything that's gonna go on. It's like, I'm gonna see some Goombas, or... I kind of have a feel of what Mario games are like. Even if this one is, like, way different, how different could it possibly be? Yeah. It's like... I don't know. It's like, I kind of get a feel of what Disney movies are like. Yeah. And the new one could... You know, I haven't seen Moana, but how different could it be? I think I know what's going to happen in this movie. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't really get that far, but, you know, it's, it's like the same. You've got Bowser's minions, and then they fight you in a slightly different, but using the same skills that you do for the entire time as, like, what you've been doing. And then you, you go and you fight Bowser at the end. I'm sure that's what happens in Odyssey. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe you collect a million <laughs> moons. I'm sorry that this has turned in more into... Let's just Let's shit, on, just shit Odyssey. on Odyssey instead of Hat in Time. But, like, seriously, the character in Hat in Time... Is incredible. The boss fights, of course, are all pretty dang memorable. I'm doing that thing again where I've played this game a long <laughs> time ago and I haven't played it since. But, like, I platinumed the game. Like, that's how engaged I was. I mean, there's all these little segments that are fun. And you get all of these great additions to your hat and all of these cool hats where, like, even when you gotta go back and be like, Oh, well, now that I have this hat, I can go jump on this platform and then get this extra yarn so that I can get more abilities and stuff like that. Doing the one-hit boss, again, not tying directly into the game itself, but you know, like the one-hit boss challenge where there's mm -hmm. a patch that makes you take one hit and die. <laughs> where I, I fought Mafia, which is fun. The first, I think it's just called like Mafia Island, and the <laughs> enemies are just Mafia. Mobsters? No, 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 they're Mafia. Oh. That's what they're called, and they're just like, Mafia. Whenever you talk to them and they say stuff like that, and then, like, Head Mafia is a sh chief. This game, for the 15th time, has so much character, yeah. and it's so fun, and it's not that long, very easy to get into, mm -hmm. super easy to pick up, very fun. I played in the game. It's a great game. I would recommend it. Nice. Head in time. Yeah, I, I really gotta pick that up. And I hear it's got co-op now, so I wonder how that... Now, yeah, it didn't have co-op when I played it, mm -hmm. and I think that was a big reason that Mac got all excited, but yeah, <laughs> I would, yeah. You want to pick up, we can see what that co-op's like. <laughs> Alright, my number seven is everyone's favorite hero shooter. It's Paladins. Oh. Of course it's Paladins, and you, you got a big taste of it yesterday. Indeed. Um, but Paladins, we started playing it, I think about maybe a month ago, and we saw there was a video, I think it was made by Shammy. And he was just detailed. I love Shammy. Yeah. I'm so happy you guys have discovered Shammy. <laughs> yeah, because he just made a, a very detailed breakdown of Overwatch versus Paladins. And it's almost like when Overwatch came out, there was this game called Paladins. And people were like, wow, isn't that like Overwatch? But in, in the same vein, they also did that to Battleborn. Battleborn yeah. was not like oh, yeah, Battleborn. Overwatch at all. I'm not trying to say that Battleborn's good because I haven't played it. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like Paladins is enough of a different game to differentiate itself. There's room for both Overwatch and Paladins, and I think they really have different strengths, and after playing both, I can say, like, Overwatch is very, very good at being accessible, having a very cohesive aesthetic, looking very good, and everything works. <laughs> and Paladins is very good at, it's got really good gunplay. Yeah. The, the characters are fun to use, there's a lot of customizability, and there's even a degree of, like, if you play Overwatch, it's just a game of rock, paper, scissors, and who has the ult. Because the ult is like the kid that goes, yeah, well, I have gun, and gun beats rock, paper, and scissors. <laughs> and then, uh, maybe your team has two guns. <laughs> Paladin, it's like, okay, well, they're doing really good. For The healers are really healing and we can't take them down. Or maybe they keep putting up shields and we can't break through the shields. All right, I'm going to buy an item that makes me destroy shields faster. Or I'm going to reduce health or reduce healing. Or I'm going to 
destroy like little turrets that somebody could throw out. And obviously you don't have to buy that if they don't have the turret building person on their team. There is a little bit more strategy than just, okay, well, they switched to rock, so I guess I'm gonna switch to paper. It's tough because obviously I haven't played as much Paladins as Overwatch, and I made the analogy that it's like, you know, you ever think that you're really smart in high school? And you're like, wow, I didn't even really have to try, but I got all A's. Or, you know, I'm at the top of the class, or I aced a test or something. And then you get into college, and you're like, holy shit, these people are all smarter than me. These people are way better than me. That's what it's like when you play, like, a competitive game, and then you get placed into your actual spot. Because after a while, you know, you play Overwatch long enough, you play Rocket League long enough, and you're like, wow, these people are just way better than me, and I'm never going to get to that point. And so it's tough because in Paladins, I'm still in high school, and I'm still like, I'm a god amongst men here, you know? I don't even have to try and I'm crushing it. All I gotta do is if I'm playing a flank, actually flank instead of run up the middle. <laughs> Sometimes it is as easy as that. Um, but, but you do have these like really close matches and there's something different about it. And it's just really fun. And it, it's almost got like that jank factor that not all the pieces are there. It's like getting held together by rubber bands or something. It makes it kind of charming, uh, although at some point Everyone will agree that it kind of loses its charm when you're trying to just play with your friend and you keep getting a message that says the party is no longer active and then you gotta close the game out or something like that. Like, it's a buggy mess, but at the same time, it's got such good gameplay. I think it's really fun. But sometimes you get that message and the party is still active. <laughs> yeah, you get that message once you pick your champion and you get it once you start the game and once you end the game. <laughs> <laughs> Even though there were no problems at all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's great. I'm very much excited. That's a nice out analogy. But I think when we were playing Rocket League, what, what always kept us in was that we were we were a team. There'd be people flying around, and we were like, okay, rotate, you're goalie. Okay, now I'm goalie. All right. <laughs> and then, you know, we weren't doing anything impressive, but we had our fundamentals down, damn that's it. That's true. And that's, that's true. what was important about Rocket League. You can fly all over the place, but if you fly all over the place and miss the ball, well, then Matt's just going to hit the crossbar. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of my best friend Matt in the beginning of this year, my number seven is Cuphead. Cuphead, yeah. I forgot you guys played that. Cuphead is a neat little game in which you run in and shoot. Matt's favorite kind of game. Yeah. He's a big Mega Man guy. I don't play a lot of these games, but you know what? We do like to play a lot of co-op games. <laughs> so you can play Cuphead co-op and Golly, is it hard? Yeah, I was gonna say, it seems hard. It is a very, very hard game. I believe we played it... I don't think there's a difficulty. There probably isn't a difficulty, but I... There's something that's telling me we played it on, like, an average difficulty. <laughs> and we're like, oh, man. That was intense. But, again, highs and lows. Yeah. You can get defeated by the silliest, dumbest thing, but the levels are so quick mm -hmm. that you can just... Get right back in there, yeah, and just go back at it. Uh, <laughs> should really play these games again. What's hard? What's hard is that Matt totally owns this game, and I don't. So we always played it with him. Yeah. Even though you know it'd probably be a neat game to play if I had like a second yeah uh, Xbox One controller, <laughs> but I just got the one. So back to aesthetics, you know. Yeah, it looks really nice. Oh, and it is very unique. It looks really nice, it flows perfectly, and I believe the creator said they will never, ever do it again. <laughs> like, yeah, I believe it. Was it was just so miserable having to record how many things. It's like, you know, you have a boss who does one swing, it's like 20 frames drawing. <laughs> of drawing the same flower whipping out this tongue thing that whips the screen. It never gets old, and it always looks amazing, and it just, it continues to keep impressing you. The music, same thing. The music literally carries the game start to finish, where it fits aesthetically, and then there are these original songs where you have these, I don't know how to describe 20s, 30s music, but, you know, you have these... <laughs> Swing to... Barber, yeah, like, barbershop-esque singers uh -huh. swinging to, you know, this... It was that crank. Oh, uh, the gramophone. Gramophone. It's got that, you know, it's got those sticking sounds. And <laughs> the popping. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they put everything huh. into this game, and it is a blast. 
Yeah, I, I will say I haven't played Cuphead either, and it, I'm kind of surprised that I haven't because that and I had in time. I knew they were good just because of how you and Matt sort of reacted to it and what I've been hearing on the internet, but I just never got around to playing it. But I think I really need to because it, it does sound like I'm missing out on something that's very, very unique. And I can play it in, in the platformer, and it's just not going to give the same sort of vibe as uh, Cuphead is. Yeah. And it's perfect because now we all own Xbox Ones. <laughs> so, how great is that? I don't actually know if this is on co op. If it is, I would love to play it with you. I'd love to play it again. Oh, that means I gotta get live. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Never mind. <laughs> maybe, maybe when I'm over, one of us will have it. And yeah. We'll just be, it will be like, all right, we'll play a little more cup bed. Yeah, I like the variation. They give you a lot of different guns, and sometimes you, you really need to change the guns that you yeah. go into with because some of the bosses just jump around more than you need. It's like there's like a lobber that's just like these little tiny balls yeah. in which it's hella effective if you've got something that's standing still. And like that too is like variation. It's mm -hmm. like the parry. The parry becomes a very important thing. Some levels are just based on you need to parry this in order to continue, hmm. in order to get something to activate. It's like there's one that you're on a train where literally you're either in the middle, left, or right side, and there's those two, what you'd use on those old-timey train carts that make uh, you yeah, 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 yeah. pump. It's like they s simplified it in the animation uh -huh. where there are two parries on the end, and it's like, well, an attack is coming where you're standing. If you fall off the track, you take a hit because you hit the ground. Yeah. But if you can move it, <laughs> then you don't get attacked. So you have to parry aside. <laughs> and then, like, the co-op, saving other people, you just have these incredible moments. Oh, yeah. Of just uh, you reaching down from the cliff and you manage to grab your friend at the last second. People, they'll be above the screen. <laughs> and you'll hit them. And then in that old-timey voice, your partner goes... Thank you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, we're still in this, we got this! And it's, oh, every time you beat a boss, it's just, you yell. That's good. You yell loud, it's great. Yeah, it's that's so awesome. rewarding. Cuphead. Very hard, absolutely recommend playing it for everybody. <laughs> All right, my number six, uh, coincidentally also on the Xbox One. Uh, I think this is the only game that I have on my list that I played on the Xbox One. And it was a surprise to me. And I think it's obvious why, because it's Forza Horizon 4. So I picked that game up early this year. I'm always trying to, to break into other genres that I'm not so experienced in. Like, I played a few racing games last year, uh, and they didn't really do it for me. They never really drew, drew me back in, but something about this game is just very, very satisfying. I think it was how fun it was to just drive around and crash into stuff, like knock over walls and knock over guardrails, which I'm pretty sure don't work like that in real life. I'm pretty sure they're not built to fall. <laughs> um, but then the actual races are pretty fun. You'll do like a nine minute race. And somehow, I'm pretty sure I did a nine minute race. I entered first place, like within the last 300 yards. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I did it. Ah. And so it has this sense of satisfaction of it started with Beat Saber, it's, I started it off and I'm like, I okay, I get an idea of how to play this, but it wasn't so easy to where I was just winning every race, but it was, I was never like falling way behind, and I always felt like I was at an appropriate difficulty level, you know? And some fundamentals that still escape me, I honestly have no idea when to ever use the e-brake, because I get the drift, but I don't know how or when, uh, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> Sometimes you can just use a regular break. And then I think this game has probably the best implementation of vibration of any game. Because for some reason, when I'm playing it in the controller, and Rona was saying this, they were sitting next to me, and they're like, I can feel it whenever you're crashing through like a, a stone wall and knocking it down. It's shaking the whole couch. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it's got very, very good feedback, I guess. You know, you, you're accelerating, and you, you feel like a slight vibration that feels normal, you know? And it's it's probably one of those things that you don't know how uh, normal it feels until you have it unavailable. It's like I remember uh, every once in a while I would play Tony Hawk, and for some reason when I would grind, it didn't vibrate the controller. I was mm -hmm. like, this is, this is weird. And it doesn't feel right. But it's like, when you're driving this car, there are a bunch of cars to drive, and you're like driving through fields and launching off cliffs, and you can rewind time. The entire time you're like, yeah, this feels right. 
Just make sure you keep batteries in your Xbox controller. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been running on the same pair, and I think I gotta replace those soon. I can't believe it still uses batteries. I know. Yeah, I think that's a thing where once it starts to get low, I, yeah, it kind of stops doing vibrate just mm -hmm. to save battery. Yeah. Well, what's the point, you know? The vibration fun is like half the reason to play the game, so... Right. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, it's just really fun. And even though I don't have live, I did have these moments where I would see like ghost players just driving past. Like I would just be sitting in the road, I'd look at my phone and I'd look up and there'd be somebody just staring at me. And I would start spinning in circles and they would start spinning in circles. <laughs> I was like, nice. <laughs> We're on the same page here. <laughs> so it's, it's just a lot of fun. I, I liked it a lot. And I, I think I'm going to keep playing it, going in and out of it, kind of like I did with Steep. I don't think I'm going to like get all the achievements or anything because I just don't think I'm that good at racing. Yeah. But it's it's certainly a fun game that I can play and not feel bad about if I lose and feel pretty good about if I win, so. I think Horizon really well bridges that gap between Forza Motorsports yeah. in which UG and then <laughs> your complete arcade racers like Flat Out or Burnout. Mm -hmm. It's like a good balance between the two. You're using real life cars. Yeah. But you know, it's not so realistic that it's the end of the world that you have to emergency brake drift perfect all the time. Yeah. I was just really hurt by Gran Turismo 3. This is one of the first games from my PS2, and I'm like, I just want to crash people. This ain't fun. I'm not having fun. Except one time I had a lot of fun because I drove backwards on the course, and then I hit another car, and we just, it was the goofiest thing I've ever seen. We rainbowed into the air. Aww. Both cars fine. Both PT Cruisers landed right on the ground. <laughs> so, my number six. I know we like to recommend games to each other. <laughs> This is good. First game that was recommended to me, but in turn, I'm going to recommend a game to you. My number six is Firewatch. Have you ever played the Firewatch commentary experience? No, I haven't, actually. So, Firewatch, everything that we said about it last year, they're actually the developers and the actors and the artists and everybody who went into designing the game based on the same aesthetic yeah. that this game goes through, their tape decks that they put in each day, every level, you walk up, you put it in your Walkman, and then literally you're playing Firewatch again, oh while God. developers and actors are talking about the design of the world and everything you're looking at. Alright, that's it. I'm, I'm reinstalling Firewatch. Yeah. Okay, it's so good. It's really good, and the best thing about it is, um, you probably played it on PC, right? No, I actually played it on my PS4. Oh, that's per- oh yeah, that's right, you did have it installed. What's good is those extra trophies, Yeah. they explain exactly how to get all of them. <laughs> what's perfect, it's like this little thing where they're like, some encounters where you're just walking, they're like, it's too easy for you to encounter that on this day. So if you go back on a different day where you don't actually walk that path, a certain thing gets activated, and you're like, oh, cool. And then it gives you a little trophy. And that's why I think all of the... I don't remember what the trophies were for the base game. I think they were all just basically get this far. Yeah, just and then games. And then one is like the audio experience. And you can accidentally get audio experience ones uh -huh. in the first game, which you probably did. Because it's like when you get into the one facility and you open the the clipboard thing and a bee stings you. And you're like, did I just get a trophy for having a bee sting? <laughs> <laughs> they explain it. Anyway, it's a Firewatch itself, the actual game. Is it's one of these story-based games where you just walk and you experience a story in front of you. I honestly say that I probably liked it more than Gone Home and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. It's deep. It's man. It's really just really good. Talking with your boss and getting deeper in these moments. It's the whole thing. Is it's so easy to get engrossed. Yeah. In this entire story, and I remember I think I played Firewatch within like. One week of time. Yeah. And here it is on number six. Like, I still think about Firewatch every once in a while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, sorry. No, it just really has really, really compelling writing. And I said stuff like it last year where I was like, it makes me feel like I could do something like this when in reality it's just because, one, the thing that's going on is interesting, and two, the characters are really, really likable. Yeah. When in reality I know I'd just be bored out of my mind. Uh, oh, yeah. Or I would be stressed out of my mind because actual forest fires which is why it's perfect they pace the game perfectly yeah if you played 77 days of being a <laughs> oh guy God, watching yeah. for forest fires 
It would be boring. Yeah. It would but be they so... pull out the perfect days and they make you walk the perfect paths. Mm -hmm. Like, as you said, you're right. You do stop using the map because it literally does become that familiar. Mm -hmm. It's not like the map is necessarily small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty big map. For, where... for a game that you move that slowly in. Yeah. You would know, um, it, this is recommendation phase, you will know if you'll really like the game based literally on the intro. Oh, yeah. The, the prologue scene, which is not gameplay, that'll tell you how it's written, what the story is like, literally what your main character is going through during the story. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And, I mean, honestly, I, I don't really want to think about spoiling anything... Some of the dialogue options, even, I think, going through a second time mm -hmm. and doing it on a commentary track and even seeing what your talking trees go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's incredible. And it, just to have these games that are so based in reality and you know it feels completely realistic. And it's like, you know, you could believe that this really happened. Yeah. Even though it's obviously the aesthetic is kind of like little Pixar looking. You know, it's yeah. not like real ultra realistic graphics, but you don't need it because it's ultra realistic sounding characters. And it's funny because the main character, I can't remember his name, the main character, it's like... Is it Hank? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That sounds right. Um, he's played by an actor in, if you watched season five, four, five of The Office... He's like the one character who tries to convince Pam to stay <laughs> in New York City. It was it's Henry. That was close. Henry. Uh, oh, yeah, because I think Delilah asks, mm -hmm. would you like to be called Hank? <laughs> uh, Firewatch, I would absolutely recommend picking it up. I'm sure they throw them on sales all the time. Yeah, it's uh, it's just a really good game. And I'm, I feel kind of bad because I, I didn't play any games like that this year. I actually, this is the first year in a long time I didn't have like a really short story-based experience. And not because there aren't any. Like uh, the the developers that made To the Moon, they have a new game out that I didn't play. And uh, the developers of Gone Home have a new game, uh, Tacoma, that I haven't played yet. And I really should because I see no reason not to. And Life is Strange 2 is out. Oh, that's true. Life is Strange 2 is out. I... It's not It's not complete, and so I don't feel bad about not playing it. But also, I don't care, I guess. You, I think you shouldn't care. I, the I'm first very... time is so good on its own. Maybe yeah. I'll play Beyond the Storm. I'll play with the... Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I'll play uh -huh. with the, the characters that I, that I like, but... Uh -huh. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Life is Strange still will be complete and people are like, wow, it's way better than the first one, and I'll give it a try, and then we'll see you in three years. Well, I might also be a little biased, one, because of what I thought of Life is Strange, and two, because <laughs> I, I watch a lot of your movie sucks, and on his Let's Play channel, he just destroys like the Life is Strange games. True, yeah, and I saw a little bit of that, and I felt a little bit weird, because it's like, yeah, I get it, but at the same time, it's like... I don't know, it's tough to say. I didn't watch that much because I got the impression that he was saying, if you like this, then you're an idiot. And I'm like, wow, I do like this. He's very hypercritical and dismissive of yes. the Life is Strange games. Which that, makes me feel okay because I didn't like the Life is Strange game mm -hmm. that much. But I really wish that we could get that that nice little rewinder power in, you know, Telltale games. That'd be nice. <laughs> I'd like that. I wish I could just have that. <laughs> All right. You good? Oh, of course I'm good. All right, my number five is uh, something you've all heard about. It is Enter the Gungeon. Ooh. Yeah, uh, I played it a lot, a bit more than you did, which was, what, once four months ago? <laughs> <laughs> I feel weird because I still haven't beat the final boss, but I put about 70 hours into it. And at, at one point, the biggest reason that I stopped is because of, like, I don't know if I'm getting any better. And I get really frustrated because... You've, you've gotten to the final boss? Yeah, I've gotten to him, like, so many times. How many levels is that? I think five. Oh, okay. There's five, like, dungeon right. layers. That's amazing, though. Like, I've got a friend at work. Can't do it. I think he, he's gotten to three, maybe a little bit into four. But, man, you're nuts. <laughs> I, was, I was so mad because one time I made it to the boss, and I only had half a heart of health. Oof. And I got the boss down to like 15% health. And I'm like, I shouldn't have lived this long, but I did somehow. You know, it's that adrenaline thing. You're like, oh, whatever. I'll just be gun ho We'll see what happens. Ooh, what if I win? Wouldn't that be wild? <sighs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I really like it. Maybe I'll actually get into it again in a serious way. I'll get back on that grind. But I don't know. After I lost Steam, I was less compelled to play it, especially with 
all the games that came out in the year's end. But it, it was a really, really good game to sort of play in spurts. And, you know, I'd play like one round before bed. And the longer matches tend to take about 45 minutes or something. Or like, uh, you know, we, we went on a trip to Seattle and I played uh, a match on the plane or a few on the plane. And it's just a nice sort of... Another thing to do, it takes out some time, and I really liked it, and I, I played Dead Cells, which is kind of a similar game, but it's not uh, in the same way it is that sort of roguelike, you got one shot to go through the whole thing, and it just didn't grab me in the same way, like, I, I don't know, I think, I think I was just bad at it, <laughs> I think that was one of the things, it didn't help that there's a parry mechanic, I played that in, uh, at the same time as another game that also has a parry mechanic, but the timing is just a little bit differently. Oh. So I messed up like every single dodge in Dead Cells and I was like, this game is impossible. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really liked Enter the Gungeon. It's fun to play with uh, another person. It's kind of hard to explain. I almost feel like you can't play it with somebody in co-op if it's like their first time. They need like a few rounds on their own to get a grip of what's going on instead of just being led around because I feel like you might give them um, a misrepresentation of how the game should be played or something like that. But Obviously it's hard to do if they don't own it already, and why would they if you're introducing them to it? So, I don't know, it's just really fun, it's really creative as we said, and I don't know, it's it's just the sort of game that I needed in that time of the year, you know? Just sort of a, a long grind and I can play it, I can not play it, I can hop in, hop out, and uh, feel like I'm making some progress, and feel like I'm, I'm getting there, you know? Until I didn't, and then I stopped playing it. <laughs> no, I love that grind. Yeah, it's that game. There are games like that. I used to do this with Amplitude, where it was like I have to play this game like once a day. Yeah. Because I want to just continue to get a little better. Yeah. And it's like that feeling of like I'm getting farther. I'm getting. I'm doing something. I'm doing something. We'll get there. <laughs> so let's let's keep that recommendation train going. Um, clearly, you probably know what this is before I even try to explain it, but. Um, this morning when I ordered this list, it became very, very hard to deal with these middle games. <laughs> when there's something in a game that I may easily never relate to more in my whole <laughs> life to than this. My number five is What Remains of Edith Finch. Yeah, yeah. This is, I'll explain it real quick. It's the same deal as Firewatch, except, you know, I just described a realistic game where you can believe it happened in reality. This one's like a fairy tale. A fairy tale, huh? Yeah. It's like a grim tale of terror or whatever you yeah. would call those old tiny stories, this German folklore. Yeah, <laughs> no, I get, yeah, I get it. I get where it. Um, it's like a fantasy, and it describes this family and the unfortunate events of this little family that live in this crazy house that mm -hmm. you explore. I'm underplaying the game as a whole, and I feel bad for that, because really, this game goes everywhere yeah. in its storytelling, and that's what's really the amazing part about it, is every time you go into another character's story, you don't know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. yeah, not only do you not know what their story is, you don't know how it's going to be represented. Most of the time, you don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes, it's, it's kind of apparent mm -hmm. from the start, but um, it's amazing, because you'll control something completely different. Yeah. One, like, there's one where... I'm going to say spoilers right now. Skip to this time code if you don't want spoilers on Edith Finch. Absolutely go play it. It's the best. It's like there's one where you're in a comic book. Yeah. And there's a cute little comic book aesthetic. And then there's one where literally it's one of those like flip books. It's like yeah. the oldest guy. You literally just flip between yeah, it's a, pages. It's a viewfinder. Yeah, it's a viewfinder. I remember I missed that one and didn't yeah. get the trophy for that one. And I'm like, oh, oh, this is how you keep using the viewfinder. Yeah. It's like there's one where there's a kid who's mad. There's like a oh, yeah. stepmom getting he's, married. Yeah, yeah, his parents get married and doesn't like his stepmom or something. And he's flying a kite and then just like he gets hit with the thing. Was his, I feel like his name was Calvin. Like, yeah. Calvin Finch. The fucking... Calvin was on the swing set. The swing set. It mm. was amazing. Yeah. Like, like that's... Uh, like that captured a feeling that, you know, you've always thought of as a kid and then it happens and it's like, whoa. Yeah. That was so well done. Yeah, and it's um, like the small details that sort of enhance that, you know. You can get the idea of what's going to happen by just saying, yeah, it's a story of tragedy and he was on the swing set. But, like, you look down and, you know, you're, when your feet are kicking, you got a broken leg, right? And you're like, this kid's already getting into some shit. Because he's just six, he can, he's all that, and he can jump off the rooftop or whatever, and he's fine. And then, oh. Uh, 
sadness. And and yeah, when, when some things aren't based in reality, it's like they'll literally make the story mm-hmm. like continue to move in this like fairy tale line. Like I think the first kid just falls out the window. <laughs> like I think the first kid just falls out the window of like a three story house out of the start, and that's it. I, th- One of I them... think it. I think it was the uh, the the berries. The, oh. the mistletoe berries or the holly berries or oh, okay. yeah. It's like my favorite one that's that simple is just it's just the baby in the bathtub. Oh my god, that was so That one is like I really, really liked that one. I think that was Jeffrey. Yeah, that one's like so sad, yeah. but at the same time it's so whimsical. Yeah. Because like... you're just from the perspective of the baby. Yeah. It's... Okay. <laughs> so in part this game is a complete package. It's incredible. And then you get to Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Lawrence goes out of high school, and he works at the cannery. And what happens is... Sorry, let's let's give me backstory and why I've never related to something so much in my life. Um, I've worked at McDonald's since 2011. Like, right now I'm back in school again, so I'm back in McDonald's. So, of course, I just work this job that's just, you know, there to, you know, get money. Mm-hmm. I can get the hours I want. It's perfect. Lawrence's story is about, he's at the cannery, and his job is literally to... It's just slice the fish. Slice the heads off the fish. Put the rest of the body on the conveyor belt. Put the rest of the body in a conveyor belt. All you're doing is you're controlling an arm. Mm -hmm. And it starts, and you're like, this control's kind of not great. It's kind of weird, and like the fish, you miss the fish, and you're like, ah, oh, but you move yeah. kind of slow, and it's like your hand has a magnet on it, and the fish has a magnet on it, and you have to try and get it to line up with the fish magnet instead of actually just grabbing the fish or something. Yeah, like yeah, it's you're like, oh, this is, you know, well, weird. This is weird, and it, it doesn't work. But then you start to realize that you're slowly getting it, mm-hmm. and they start to tell the story of Lawrence and how he's this really good employee. Mm-hmm. And the entire time you're just grabbing and, the fish. And you're doing this while they're telling the story and how, you know, everybody thinks he's fine. He's a great guy. He talks to people at work. And, you know, he gets there. He does his job. He's never late. He's a great guy. So at this point, you're starting to perfect your ability to chop mm-hmm. off fish heads. And they're coming even faster, but it doesn't matter because you're still doing so well. And you're not even really thinking about you're it. You're like... absolutely not thinking about it at all. And then what starts to happen is Lauren starts to daydream the story mm-hmm. where with, I believe, the second stick, you start to control Lawrence as this small person mm-hmm. who's literally conquering the world. Yeah. While you're doing this, it's starting to, like, almost fade out that you're literally chopping the heads off these fish, mm-hmm. but you're not. And you're still doing it, and you're controlling two things, and Lawrence is so inside his own head... That he doesn't realize that he's losing his mind, yeah. practically, mm-hmm. because he's imagining this world in his head that's a billion times better than this cutting fish heads so off. So much better than cutting fish heads off, but still, people think he's doing fine, Yeah. until I don't even remember what happens to him descriptively. It doesn't matter. Like, never have I seen something so well conveyed of just doing a meaningless job and having your mind wander. Mm-hmm. Because that's what working... I mean, McDonald's, I'm basically a grill employee. And I've been a grill employee this entire time, and I'm the best at it. But what I describe to people is that I'm a robot. Yeah. Because I become a robot where literally I'll make a sandwich, and then I'll look at the people who are receiving the sandwich, and I'll say, Did you need that? I'm not sure you needed that. I kind of just blacked out a little bit there. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. What, that's what happens... Never will anything describe what working a simple job is like. Yeah. It's one of those things where you, you can't just say it in words or how it feels. You have to provide some sort of uh, analogy or something that uh, you can look at and say, Oh my god, this is what's happening. It's perfect. Yeah, that, it was it was really wild and it was incredibly well done. It's perfect. It is, I swear, it is the most relatable thing that will ever, ever happen in a video game. So, Edith Finch, it's about a two hour experience. It's great start to finish. You'll start it and you won't want to stop it. It's really, really good. And I, I think at this point, I might have said it last year, and I, I don't remember. It's really close with that. And, like, I, I really liked Firewatch, but it's always tough between, you know, that and Gone Home and some of the other ones that I've played, To the Moon, stuff like that, which one's my favorite. I'm, I'm really not sure. They keep switching spots. Right now, Edith Finch, I still hold really, really highly in my mind. And then, I don't know, it's tough. I do that with Firewatch, too, but for very, very different reasons, so... 
I don't know. Just, yeah, go check it out. It's really, really good. And they're all different stories, and they all get different things. Like, I mean, I hold it directly higher than Firewatch. You, I believe, put Firewatch higher last year. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, it's just where you are and how you're feeling. But absolutely, Edith Finch, it's amazing. All right. My number four is that game that I was playing that had a different uh, parry time than Dead Cells. It's Spider-Man for the PS4. Oh. Every time you get, like, your spidey sense, you gotta hit a button. And, uh, it's pretty lenient with that. And in Dead Cells, every time <laughs> they, like, wind up, you gotta hit a button. But you actually gotta wait a little bit before you hit the button or else you get hit. Uh, so anyways, yeah, I played Spider-Man. Uh, I don't know if I talked about it before in the past, but my favorite Spider-Man game is Ultimate Spider-Man for the PS2. I think that one gets a bad rap, uh, and I think it's better than people think it is. Because it gets overshadowed by Spider-Man 2. And, um... I honestly didn't play that one that much, but this entire time, everybody's like, well, is this Spider-Man going to be the next good one? You know, and it's like, yeah, sure, Web of Shadows or whatever, the 360 ones, they're fine, but they're not like, it's not necessarily what people want. And this one is fucking good. It's fun. I think that the, one of the most telling things about it is that it's very repetitive, but at no point was I like, I don't want to keep doing this repetitive thing. You know, I'm fine to swing around the city. I don't need to use a fast travel. Because it's fun to swing around the thing. Oh, yeah. Combat is really fun because it's it's very dynamic and it seems like straightforward and formulaic. But I think there's a good amount of variety to it. And obviously, there are all sorts of gadgets and upgrades that I just never used because I just really liked the one that I have. <laughs> it's like every suit has a different suit power, and I just did the one that lets me throw people instantly. <laughs> so I'll use it. I'll just <laughs> I'll just pick people up, and swing them, and throw them at other people. Pick people up and throw them and swing them at other people. Right, it's telekinesis and Bioshock. <laughs> I mean, what else do you need? <laughs> and it was just really fun. You know, it looked great. Story was good, great. I don't yeah, know. That's all it had to be. I mean, if you've heard about it, you've heard the common complaints that the stealth parts are dumb, and they are. Yeah. They're really dumb. I'm like, listen, I don't play Spider-Man games to walk around in a museum. <laughs> right, I play shivers to do that. <laughs> but once once it gets to that, the web slinging, the the combat. I mean, really, that's all there is to the game. There's cutscenes and there's a story, but it's just web slinging and combat, and that's fine because that's all you need. Because there isn't another game like that. You know, I I always ask this: What are the big superhero games that are out right now? Are there any? Do they exist? Was the last one Saints Row Four, and was the one before that Crackdown? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What about? Injustice 2, huh? <laughs> I, okay, yes, I guess. What about Superman 64, you yeah. know? <laughs> what about Sneak King? What, oof, that's the the truest of superheroes. What about Big Bumpin'? Yeah, everyone loved that. That's the most ambitious crossover since Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> yeah, it's there's not really that much to say about it. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can look at, like, 50 seconds of gameplay and say, this is something that I want to play, or... Maybe it's not for me. And if it is, great. Play it, because there's not that much like it. I'm there, man. I really want to play it. <laughs> I would love to play it. And I, I remember, like, I watched E3. Yeah. I, I watched PS the PS4 E3. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that looks insane. It's good. I had a pretty intense semester, I'll just say that much. <laughs> where I, yeah, I kind of devolved into playing two games the last half of the year, and I, I really, really want to play this because, you know, Insomniac, they do a good job, we'll get there, <laughs> and that's kind of why I was like, I really, really want to play this game, but, you know. Alright, so I'm a number four, keeping this thing rolling, where, you know, all my last picks have been things recommended to me from previous years. So, of course, my number four is, as I've learned, maybe one of the most overrated games of all time. <laughs> it's Undertale. Ah. Oh, look at me. I'm joining all those crazy Rick and Morty fanboys <laughs> playing a game that's so good. I guess maybe at the time, the hype was probably a little bit too much for most to handle because, you know, if you didn't play it, you were probably a lesser person, according to maybe some Undertale fans. But now that the dust has settled, you can say it now that Undertale is... A fantastic game. It is a amazing little RPG experience. I can tell you that for sure because I don't like RPGs at all, usually. You know, I play my Pokemon here and there, but I can't really do that anymore. I'm not 
into these kind of turn-based combat games. But yeah. Undertale is its own special little thing where you got your little box and you try not to eat it <laughs> and you could play it how you want. You could either accidentally kill one person really early on because you don't understand how to do things or then, you know, don't kill anybody or kill everybody. Yeah. It's all up to you. I had Undertale on my list probably like three years ago and I put it on my, my top games revised at some point. But I think the longer time I spend away from it and the more I hear people talk about it, I think the more the more and more I like it, like, that game hit just about everything right. Yeah. Right, and in a different way. Like, everything... At some point, it just becomes more impressive when you look at the entire thing than, like, when you're actually playing through the game, I feel like. Because that's what happened with me. Afterwards, I'm like, all the music is really good. All the writing is really funny. All the themes of the game, they work really well together, and the whole thing is just really creative. It's, it's almost impressive in a sense that it all worked together so beautifully. So Undertale is just really good, and I think everybody should should play it. Well, you said it best when you kind of saw me like start to play this. Yeah. Where you were like, you know, there's just no part of this game that I didn't like. Yeah. There's no lull, there's no bad part. There's like one character who's kind of a little like... Uh, <laughs> like, just calm down. Like, calm down a little bit. That's it. Like, everything else is amazing. And mm -hmm. you, you said it, music. I mean, I yeah. cannot stop. I just, all the time, I'll just be, like, at work, and I'll just start whistling, like, dog song. Dog song, yeah. And then my coworkers will be like, that's dog song. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's dog song. Of course it's dog song. Yeah, yeah. Just, like, the music is so good, and the, like, the charming art style, it's mm -hmm. like, it's something that you just will not forget. For, yeah. you know, like a four to five hour experience. It's like there are all these moments where you're like, man, you remember that time when you walk into Temi's shop? Yeah. It's like, oh, that was awesome. Like, oh, remember Spider Bake Sale? Yeah. Oh, like that was sure. awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, the more I've heard people talk about it, and I haven't, like, played it since, you know, whenever I last had it on my list, but I, I am kind of interested in playing it again. I want to see, maybe play through it again, and just sort of take it all in from a different perspective after having beaten it and heard about it. Because, uh, I don't know, I think, I think I'm coming to terms with it being just, like, a really, really, really good game. So it sounds like what you want to do is genocide run, my guy. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm never touching it again. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> understand how people can do that and feel okay. Yeah, I guess that's one of the impressive things about it. Is it's like you know this weird pixel game where you're killing monsters and you're like, oh man, I feel bad for killing monsters. Yeah, you, you, no, everything's so charming and has yeah. so much character. You don't want to kill anything unless you're heartless. And you want to see what happens, but I I don't think I'll ever hit that point. But yeah, this seems like one of those games that I might revisit yeah. in time. And again, all the hype has died down, so now it's okay, guys. <laughs> you can give it a try, and it'll be okay. I promise. For Undertale. It's great. <laughs> Alright, uh, my number three is another indie darling. Uh, this is Celeste. Uh, Celeste is a really fucking hard platformer. <laughs> And I, I remember hearing it being told as one of the first one of those super hard games that actually takes itself seriously. And its existence isn't just a joke about how hard it is. It's obviously more serious than I want to be the guy and it doesn't have like cheap deaths like that. And it's not the point. And even like Super Meat Boy, that was like still kind of childish art. I mean, you're a blob of meat saving a meat girl or something. But this one is like, you're a person who's going to climb a mountain, and this mountain is very dangerous, why are you going to climb a mountain? I don't know, but I have to prove it to myself that I can do it, right? It goes across this self-reflection and discussion about goals and perspective and priorities and anxiety and all these things that aren't really talked about, I feel like, in games, but in a way that's enhanced by the difficulty of the actual gameplay. Like, the fact that it is so hard really, really enforces the idea of this narrative of, yeah, this is a fucking hard mountain and you're insane to try and climb it. And then once you do that, there's like, oh yeah, hey, we got a, we got a harder version of these mountains to climb. And I'm like, oh god. And then after you do that, they're like, hey, we got, we got an even harder version to climb. I'm like, oh god. <laughs> and so yeah, you know, I climbed it all. I climbed it three times. And it was great. Hundreds and hundreds of deaths thousands and thousands of death in total and it was like yeah you know what i'm gonna throw these lives away 
because you each time I play, I know I'm getting a little bit better. It's just a really good game. It's got really good music, good themes, uh, controls amazingly, and just really, really charming and really good. Uh, unlike Undertale, I don't think it's appropriate for everybody to try out. <laughs> <laughs> in the same way, I don't think everybody should play Dark Souls. Yeah. But, but if, if you think that you're up for the challenge, I think there's a lot to get out of a game like Celeste. If you can sort of empathize with the protagonist and put yourself in the same position, there's a lot of connections to be made about that. And I think, like, the character in the game, it gives you a lot to reflect on. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> it kind of... <laughs> oh, man, I had it in my head. Oh, yeah, now I remember. It reminds me of... You know, those trials in Duck Game. <laughs> it makes me just want, you know, I'm gonna try. You know, that, that yeah. one part where you gotta jump real quick, then shoot with the AK, and then manage <laughs> to hit the spot on the wall so you can jump again, then shoot with the AK yeah, some more. Yeah, yeah. Everyone likes trials. But like I said, I mean, you got those in Duck Game, but it's Duck Game. It's it's a, it's obviously not taking itself seriously. It's like for five seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's only like two or three <laughs> of them. <laughs> There's the one with the gun shooting where you have to have Matt's, like, mash finger oh my God, in order yeah. to, like, move quickly and up. And it's like if you do it twice, you're, you're out of mash finger and you mm -hmm. can't do it anymore. Mash finger. Ugh. Happy holidays. Yeah. God. Keep going. Mash potatoes, mash finger. Okay. So I didn't actually say it earlier, but I a, a small fraction of this list is the culmination of everything that we kind of played at PAX East 2016. <laughs> everything that we saw <laughs> yeah. on the floor now is its own game, and now we can play in our homes. We played Cuphead at PAX yep. East. That was about the only Xbox thing we waited for, other than I waited for Mirror's Edge Catalyst yeah, uh -huh. and could not figure out how to <laughs> find the one guy and just talk to him. Yeah, there's that guy peeking through the door, shouting from like the other end of the alleyway. Hey, come over here! <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> and I know all these people are standing behind me and staring. Anyway, <laughs> a big old thing at PAX East from probably one of my favorite developers. My number three is Pit People. Pit People. Pit People is the only turn-based strategy game that I could probably say is on my top 40. <laughs> Maybe only because Behemoth made it. It's so charming you have so much customization for all of your characters. Uh -huh. There's so much strategy and so much fun. I have combed the map so much. <laughs> I've I put on a permadeath run, and I literally I think I got my man. Why I can't rem I ah, <laughs> what are they called? The little guys, my favorite guys in the game. Oh, the people, uh, the pit, the, the pits, the pits, the pits people. They're these little anti-archer dudes, and they just have extremely fast movement, and I love <laughs> them. I love them to death. Kobolds, that's what they're called. Kobold. Kobolds. I love my kobolds. They're my favorite. Make a team of all kobolds. Run down archers. It's great. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing where every joke ranges somewhere from just so dadly and so awkward to just absolutely hilarious. They write a great game. Will Stampert, is that his name? Will? Yeah. His comeback to voice the bear. <laughs> so this raises two questions. I haven't played Pit People. I've seen a lot of it. How does it compare? Obviously, it's a different genre, but what do you think against Pit People versus Battle Block Theater? Well, it's super hard because yeah. they don't compare. <laughs> they're not really the same, but... They're, they're not the same at all. It's hard to say only because Battle Block is so well made mm -hmm. and they made such good if you want a straight game to game comparison because of course we do this all the time because we have top 40s and yeah. you know you could look at a game like Bioshock and a game like Call of Duty World at War and be like oh which one's better oh, <laughs> oh yeah, there's, yeah there's different things I mean in the end honestly think the battle blocks got maybe more just in the fact that it's just your face <laughs> even though sometimes you know just in general for pit people it just has the most customization because yeah. it's like here, you're literally swinging a polar pop at somebody, <laughs> and it's got ice damage and this much defense. And, you know, sometimes there's just the silliest things that you yeah. can use as weapons. Like, yeah. I referenced it earlier where, you know, you just have a violin, and you're just shooting out your thing. <laughs> your notes? Your, oh, no, your bow. Your bow. You're shooting <laughs> your bow off of your violin. And it's like, 
stuff like that, and then the yeah. same kind of design where you know you could customize yourself to be people. Uh huh. Where you'll be like, um, I love the the pixies in the game, so I always make everybody's head just pixies. <laughs> or no, 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 kobolds. So which, they're like kobold heads. So all of my team is just people with kobolds. There's oh a cyclops God. with a kobold head. There's a pixie with a kobold head. Everything has a kobold head. That's crazy. And then the mushroom, you can have little kobolds on the mushroom's head. So then I guess, is it just that it's so non-traditional, or at least it's a, it's got such a different sense of setting than a regular turn-based strategy game? Is that what makes it stand out? What might honestly make it stand out so much may be just the characters mm -hmm. and the comedy. Yeah, literally, I can see that. the story is surrealist, off the wall, ridiculous fantasy. And then they have these little cutscenes that are amazing, where they'll go into like a Beatles tribute song. <laughs> then the you'll see the bear will split into two faces. will have a frown and a smiley. Oh my god, it's great. It's got a nice little story. Um. I just think that it's filled a hole <laughs> that I've never really had or thought I had in my life. It's like, you know, you and Forza Horizon 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you're like, you know, I don't really like racing games, but this game, it fills that hole, mm -hmm. that special hole that nothing else does. I think that's what Pit People does for me. That's cool. And it helped that it was made by Behemoth <laughs> because I love Behemoth uh -huh. and their art style and their comedy and everything. And, like, even that, then I know, like, strategy, and then it's just fun to feel like, alright, this is how I'm gonna put my team out, this is how I'm gonna defeat this challenge. Because there's one in the game that is so stupid hard, <laughs> where there's a mission, they put you on the sun. Oh, nice. So literally, you just take damage every turn, it's like, no, this is, this sucks, this is the worst. You're trying to run around enemies who are invincible to the sun, because they live on the sun. <laughs> Your SPF 9000 sunscreen only, like, <laughs> gets you hurt. It doesn't... You would melt instantly without... See, it's just the little yeah. story touches like that. Yeah, that is pretty funny. And I think it is the a testament to the game's writing and the, the creativity and the design that it doesn't get old, right? Yeah. That, that at, at all points, you're like, yeah, I get that it's off the wall and kind of there's no rules, but there are still rules and boundaries and you get an idea of what's, uh, what's possible. And whenever the game... I guess breaks those rules or whatever. It's I don't know. It's just in an unexpected way that really makes the comedy work. So, yeah, I really gotta try to pit people. I know it's been kind of on my radar. It's been further and further since well, I didn't have an Xbox One for a while, and I just didn't want to play it on my um, computer. But I'll really have to give it a try because I obviously like Battle Block Theater a lot and um, Behemoth, and I've played it a little bit like at PAX and. I know that it's something that I will enjoy and that I'll also find funny. So yeah, I I am predicting that you will play it and it will it will most definitely be a number seven on your guest <laughs> list. It'll be something like moderately <laughs> low. I don't know why I played it so much, but I've gotten forty hours out of it. I put permadeath on and then the challenge. I love the challenge. <laughs> it's it's just a really fun game. If you want something crazy and off the wall, I would absolutely recommend Pit People. Yeah. It's different. It's yeah. definitely different, and it's. Just a great time. Yeah, I'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next year. <laughs> see you num next year at number eight on Kyle's voice. <laughs> All right, my number two. Um, it's kind of funny. I know at the beginning of the year we were like, "Well, how do we feel about um, remasters or re-releases or something like that?" And I don't know if we ever came down to like a an actual like a rule, but obviously a lot of this is just kind of how we feel and where we think something deserves to be placed. So with that out of the way, my number two is uh, the re-release of RuneScape, obviously. <laughs> it didn't even get released this year but it just got put on the mobile and I'm like oh my god this is incredible and I've been playing RuneScape since what like November 2nd or 3rd whenever it actually got released and uh, it's just been a blast it's so much fun I mean it's it's really hard to describe because you, you say yeah I mean it's like you have so many different ways to to go about anything it's like well I want to work on making arrows. It's like, okay, do you buy the arrowheads or do you make them yourself? And I'm like, well, I guess I'll make them myself. And it's like, well, do you buy the bars or do you smelt them yourself? And I'm like, I guess I'll smelt them myself. And you say this to anybody else and you're like, Calvin, those are all boring. <laughs> all those things, you, all those options that you're telling to me are boring. And I'm like, you just don't understand. And I guess that's kind of like the heart of it. I mean, I'm fine with sitting in front of like a pond for hours and hours and just fishing and dropping fish because I can ask people, I was gonna say, hey, how's it going? People will say, oh, not much, man. What's up with you? And I say, I'm on a conference call. 
And they're like, oh, you should pay attention. And I'm like, no, nah, it's fine. <laughs> or like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be doing a quest with some people and we'll be like, hey, do you remember this? And they'll be like, no, not really. I mean, I haven't played this game in 10 years. And I'm like, yeah, same. And then the person's like, yeah, I'm 24. And I was like, yeah, same. <laughs> I told the other person's like, yeah, I told my dad that I was playing RuneScape. And he goes, you're still playing RuneScape? Does it look the same as it did like 10 years ago? And I say, yeah. And I'm like, wow, yeah, same. I did that with my dad too. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. There's, it's, it's such a weird sense of like a community that I've been away from. But you, you go back into the game and more so than a game, it's just like a chat room that just happens to have skills in it. You know, so it's just it's just fun to be around, ask people what's going on, and uh, just just kind of shoot the shit with other people while going through your day to day. I don't know. It's it's a nice sense of I'm doing something, and I I like to be here with these other people, even if you know they're not saying anything, or if they say something that's um a little bit questionable, which definitely happens. A lot of people are. I think uh, the most impressive thing is the game. It's like the re-release from 10 years and a lot of people are getting back onto it, but it's impressive how many people haven't had their humor evolve f since 10 years ago. And they still think edgy jokes are funny. And I'm like, it's 2018, dude. <laughs> Let's get some real irony in here instead of just, whoa, look how wild it is that this person would suggest this. Well, the real irony is that in 2018 you're playing RuneScape. You would think so. Whoa! <laughs> you would think so. Look at you, you're an OG RuneScaper. <laughs> RuneScaper. It's, it's just, I don't know, it's so much fun and it is, it's something that's magical. I was worried that I would go back in and I'd be like, Wow, you know, I've, I've done all this stuff before and I'm not really interested in it. Nope. <laughs> I'm back in, I'm like, well, you I'm, said ready for, that. I'm ready for the grind. You said that, like, the first time we did a top 40, we were literally like, I'm I'm not sure. I, I think I just don't have that kind of addiction to grab to the grind. But you know what? I guess if you just put it in your pocket, yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's really, if I don't have to sit yeah, at my computer. If you don't have to stare straight at it, I can see how that'd be fine. It's yeah. the same thing with like Pokemon. Yeah, you know? They're like, oh, we're watching Grey's Anatomy? Well, I'm mining coal. I can do two things at once, okay? Embarrassingly, <laughs> I do the same thing with Candy Crush, and I wish I didn't. There you go. <laughs> because it's just I, like... Well, there's something that could break that habit, and it's called RuneScape <sighs> on mobile. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get right on it. <laughs> you done? Yeah, I'm done. Kind of RuneScape awesome. is awesome. <laughs> Alright, so my number two is one of those games where, you know, you buy it, and then you put it in your console, and you're like, Wow. This is my number one game of the year. <laughs> Without a fucking doubt. There's no way. There's no way there's going to be anything better than this. I, Not physically possible. This game is probably one of the saddest stories of uh, console exclusivity out there. My number two is Sunset Overdrive. <laughs> my favorite open world game wow. since Saints Row 4. Damn, that's high praise. It is so much fun. Game's so much fun, it's complete... So, like, here's the idea. In Saints Row 4, you run really fast, and you jump really high, mm -hmm. and, and that's your deal. What if, instead of that, your abilities are all based on, well, as long as you keep moving and grinding and not standing on the ground and jumping around and air dashing and doing all this, you have a super-duper multiplier and you're super strong and you have all your abilities and you're <laughs> invincible. But the instant you start walking on the ground, you suck and you get the crap beat out of you. <laughs> that okay, okay. is Sunset Overdrive. Sunset Overdrive is probably, I think, what I would say is, you know, Saints Row 4, the story is just complete camp in yeah. the situation is, well, you know, this is how our world exists. You're in a simulation. That's why everything's goofy. This game's complete camp is based around the fact that everything is meta. Nice. All the time, and that's where all the humor comes from, <laughs> because you are the protagonist. Not some named guy, not Mr. President, you. You're just a guy <laughs> who's a janitor, and then the apocalypse happens, and you're like, oh, whatever. I'll just cap these guns. I'll just shoot these guys. Who cares? It's the apocalypse. <laughs> no big deal. My Probably one of my favorite comedy moments in the whole thing because the whole game is hilarious all mm -hmm. the time it's amazing one of my favorite is where literally a character is trying to say your name and then you 
who talks the whole time, your character talks, even though he's you, they, like, ask him what his name is, and he's like, oh, I, I actually don't know what that is. <laughs> well, just, I'm just gonna keep shooting these guys. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's pretty oh. clever. I guess, so, probably the most important question is, and you, you alluded to this, but the comedy is good. Is it better than Saints Row 4? Is it consistent? I think it's absolutely consistent. I, for some reason, I have this feeling with Saints Row 4 where, like, it kind of got more serious. The comedy kind of yeah. got a little less even. I don't think that's the case with this game. Oh, wow. I think this game just keeps it up the whole time because it knows that there's nothing to be kept serious. Because you're just a dude grinding on power lines, <laughs> hopping off bouncy cars, air dashing, flipping off poles. True. All four of those things are collectibles in the game. <laughs> The idea is that they can make you abilities and boosts and guns based on the stuff you collect. <laughs> so it's like, you know, there's shoes hung up on power lines. You gotta grind and undergrind to get those shoes. Right, And then right. there's toilet paper on, like, street lamps. You gotta swing to grab those. And then floating fizzbos everywhere. <laughs> That's like the mascot. Because the whole plot of the game is that everybody drinks this new energy drink. It's called Overcharge. And it just turns everybody into spitting, attacking zombies. Nice. I can see that. That's the whole game. It's a world takeover. <laughs> it's just been amazing to be able to play one of these open world games that one, doesn't take itself so seriously, and uh -huh. two, is so fun that you just can't stop playing it. That, that's how it goes. You're just like, well, I did this right before I got a job this summer was I started playing this. So, like, literally, when I had the house to myself, just six, seven hours of Sunset <laughs> Overdrive. It's just... It's great. So many things to collect. I tried to get the game completion because it's on Xbox, but there's some really, really hard ones, and I was like, eh. <laughs> but then I bought all the DLC, and I loved playing through all the DLC. Wow. It was great. And then there's just so many touches to this game where there was this, like, TV in the game that would give, like, updates and would show, like, fan art and extra stuff outside of the game. Literally... This game is, what, 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. that old, where they just released a new video <laughs> where the guy is on it and he said, hey, this is Overdrive TV. What used to happen, and he explained it, <laughs> because it's been off this entire time, because they haven't released any new episodes in years, yeah. and, and I'm just playing the game for the first time, and they're like, hey, thanks for picking up your game. <laughs> you can check out updates and stuff like this and oh it's like God. developers acting really awkward on screen and I'm like this is the cutest thing <laughs> I have ever seen they're just talking right wow. to me that's 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 clever I like that and I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's it's a good game yeah I know as you mentioned at the beginning the console exclusivity kind of had it flew under people's radars or people have like this built-in impression of what it may be like just based off of a the fact that it might be on one system and not the other, so... I, it's good to hear that it's just a good game, you know? Console politics aside, it's just a good, fun game. And it's Insomniac. <laughs> People who made Spider-Man. True. That's True. how I knew Spider-Man was gonna be good. I'm like, <laughs> the sunset's so much fun. You're just <laughs> jumping around shooting teddy bears that explode. <laughs> <sighs> hey, if you want a copy of Sunset Overdrive, it's cheap. <laughs> it's really cheap. It's very easy to buy. You could buy it probably for the same price as you could buy a copy of Titanfall 2. <laughs> so yeah, please, go out buy Sunset Overdrive, go out buy Titanfall 2, stop playing those new Call of Duties, they're garbage. <laughs> you could be playing Titanfall 2, and instead of playing Spider-Man... No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just okay. try Sunset like you're, Overdrive. You're going into a whole other thing here. No, I don't want to... <laughs> not at all. You done? Number two, Titanfall 2. <laughs> Go. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess um, it's, honorable mentions yeah, time. It's huh? Honorable mention time. All right, so my first honorable mention is the game that I was bait and switching for my actual number two. It's Spyro Remastered. Hey. Uh, I'm a huge, huge Spyro fan, and I played both Spyro Remastered and Crash Remastered, and they were both good, you know? Uh, I had issues with both of them. I think I realized that some of the design decisions in Crash are just not that great, and they're really <laughs> dated. And it reinforced my opinion that Crash 2 is the best one. And then, after playing Spyro, I was just like, why are there these weird inconsistencies? I get that you have to update the graphics and whatever. Um, I'm, I'm glad that it has the old music, but like, every once in a while there would be like something that just barely doesn't work. It's like, the gem pickup, it works 90% of the time. 
for something as basic as collecting the most common thing that you'll collect, <laughs> I think you want that to be closer to 100. But it was a lot of fun, you know. It, it's just, I played it a lot as a kid. I think you can play it right now and still enjoy it. And I was looking forward to it, and it met my expectations. Great. <laughs> I know a lot of people really like it. Maybe I'll, I'd say maybe I'd play it, but at the same time, maybe I'll just play my PS1 copies, of which I have all of them. True. Also, why the fuck don't you have subtitles in your game in 2018? <laughs> and why is the camera so fucking close to Spyro? <laughs> Like, I want to play this game, but it's giving me a headache, dear god. <laughs> so, alright. So, I think it would be funny to be just as ironic as physically possible. Just as I said what I said. Uh, I will mention, Black Ops 4. <laughs> um, thanks to Video Game Donkey for making Black Ops 4 look like an uh, appealing as heck game. In his nice little three minute video. Okay. The multiplayer has frustrated me to a point where I think I'm done. Okay. This is why I've been talking about Titanfall 2, because I've started playing Titanfall 2 again. And what's good about Titanfall 2 is that the price has dropped so much that now people are buying Titanfall 2 again. So it's rebounding. Wait, I'm Black confused. Ops 4. Are you putting this as an honorable mention because it's making more people play Titanfall 2? Yes! <laughs> Absolutely. No, that was, no, not at all. Um, I did play, I'm getting it out of the way first, is usually I do this for the multiplayer, and I'm saying the dead opposite. Multiplayer makes me sad, and I don't want to play it anymore. The Battle Royale, I'll give it this. As opposed to Fortnite, I have at least won once yeah. in the Battle Royale for Call of Duty. There you go. So, uh, yeah, I'll give it a little bit, a little bit higher than, than Fortnite. <laughs> this is on here because 9, the zombie map... It's just great. We haven't had a zombie map in so long that doesn't involve building, that adds gimmicks to it that work. You didn't see it when we played, but if you hit L1 and R1, you pull out just a crazy random specialty weapon. <laughs> so it's like if everything hits the fan, you're like, oh, crazy random specialty weapon. The one I use is like a shotgun as one hand and just like a big like ivy sword whip hybrid. <laughs> it just goes... And it melts everything. And then there's so many, like, places where you can run in circles and it works. <laughs> and it's the first map in just years that I like. And that's why this is on here. Because IX is a great map. I even played the map, the other map, that's on a boat where you build things. I'm like, this honestly isn't bad. <laughs> I think this is a zombie recovery. I'm going to call it a zombie recovery. The zombies in Black Ops 4 are not bad. I'd love to play it with other people, <laughs> but nobody else has it, and I do not blame them at all. <laughs> Maybe the price will go down at some point. Uh, tough to say <laughs> with Activision years. games. Yeah, in three years, we'll be able to buy it for $20. <laughs> yes, I know. All right, my other other honorable mention goes to Super Hot VR. Uh, this game is really, really fun, and I think one of the, the best things about it is... When you have to show other people VR and you say, you got to check this out, this is really crazy. You put them in the shark tank and they're like, oh, crazy sharks are going to get me. And then they're like, okay, well, what's next? And a lot of times it's like, well, here's this thing that's kind of like a tech demo, you know? Or it's like uh, you play the, the, the office management one or you're acting like the chef and you're like, oh, this is kind of funny. And after a while you're like, but that's kind of it, right? Once you get over the fact that, well, it's... Bacon in the fridge and you put it on the grill. Wild. <laughs> but then you play super hot and you're like, all right, don't let, don't get shot. But also, you got your hands and you can throw bottles at people. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> and it's 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 really fun to see people experience that. And it's really fun to be in that. And you'll have these moments where there's one where I was on a plane and I ended up just sitting down and leaning back to peek behind a chair and shoot and then lean forward to avoid a bullet and then lean back again to shoot. And it's just that level of possibility. And you can you can try all these weird things and it's different. And I, I appreciate that it's a VR game that it has an original super hot that I have yet to play, <laughs> coincidentally. And um, it's like a different game. It's not like they just slapped a VR mode onto it, which is fine. But I, I just think it's, it's impressive that they, they're like, okay, well, we're gonna make an entirely new thing from the ground up, you know? I think it's a lot of fun and it deserves a lot of credit. And it's really one of those 
one of the first like, wow, this is different, and you cannot do this in anything else. Let's check it out. I actually have Super Hot Not VR for the Xbox One. Because yeah. Because it within one of those three months where I had gold, <laughs> it was free. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I got the VR pack with the regular game. And I just played the VR one, and I never played the regular one. But I, I, I think I have to, because I heard really good things about that one as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of the three months in <laughs> which I had Xbox Live, and I got free games, uh, my final honorable mention is Forza Horizon 2. <laughs> now, I did not play it for a long period of time, but I guess it's just in the story of... Why everybody should probably play any Forza Horizon in their lifetime. Maybe not one. I don't know if one's jank or not, but <laughs> I, I've heard great things about two and on. Yeah. So, just, I remember my girlfriend falls asleep, and I just got the, I got, you know, all my systems in front of me. I'm like, what am I going to do? Oh, the Xbox is hooked up. I just got Forza Horizon 2. I'll play this. And, you know, I'm on the cusp of getting, you know, maybe like a sleep. I'm like, oh, I'll try this game. It's like the most relaxing, chill, stress relieving yeah. thing I've ever put in. I'm driving along and just having a little race with somebody. And it's like, oh, went off the screen. Oh, well, I'll just guess I'll rewind now. Yeah. Oh, there. But I'm okay. And I just can't explain why something made me feel so relaxed. <laughs> And so at home, when, you know, it's not like a Burnout 3 where you're crashing people and you're having, like, the most fun, but it's just a relaxing time. I think one of the things that really benefits it, and I'm assuming that it plays similar to 4, is that it just feels, I don't know, like, right, you know? Yeah. You're playing it and you're like, I feel like I'm doing the correct motion, and it's doing that same thing on the screen, you know? And you can play a different car game and you're like, well, I tried to do this and I just spun out. Obviously, it has like a learning curve, but it, I think it's accessible enough to, to easily understand, and it's forgiving enough to make it accessible, you know? Yeah, it's it's Forza, but they like took that stick out of their butt, <laughs> and then they just made it, you know, just just a little bit arcadey. Maybe it's like 85-15, they put in like 15% arcade, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, this is a good balance. Yeah, yeah. It's a chill game. I, I, again, anybody play a Forza Horizon if you take anything from this list. <laughs> all right, uh, that's all we got uh, for honorable mentions this year. Um, I'm moving to my number one. Number one, big game, a uh, really big game. Uh, it's a game that I was really excited for when it came out, and then I didn't buy it instantly. And then I played it probably about a year after it came out, and then I thought to myself, well, why, why didn't I play this instantly? It's Persona Five. Whoa. <laughs> I think you knew it was going to be Persona Whoa. 5 because I like talked incredibly highly of it earlier this year uh, because it's just that fucking good. And it's one of those things where, yeah, sure, it's like I spent probably 100, 200 hours in that game and at no point was I like, ugh, can't believe I got to do this. It was like, yeah, I get to go home and I get to do this. It's got such a clever way of having the combat, A, not be random, and B, have some sort of choice, like important choice, because you get into random encounters late enough in like Final Fantasy or Pokemon and it's just mash A, mash A, mash A, tackle, whatever. I'm gonna one hit kill them anyways. But now there's like a degree of, well, you know, I gotta manage my resources, maybe I don't want to use my special ability, but if I do it'll take them down and I'll be able to do something else and this and that and this and that and you do have that choice and it really does elevate it from being mindless to being like just present enough to where you're like, Okay, I don't have to like stress myself out thinking about this, but like after enough of these, I may have to, right? And the story is incredible. Characters are really, really well done. I, I really like just how it's it's like it's appealing directly to me because the entire game is just the power of friendship. Isn't that really cool? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I, I like walking around the Japanese areas, talking to the random people. And it's one of those things that I don't know that there is another game that's paced like this, or structured this way, where it's half just doing mundane stuff like cleaning the house, or like going to the fish the fish place and fishing for fish, maybe seeing like your teacher there, and then the other half is you go you fight monsters in a dream world, and I'm like, yeah, I like both of these. It's like when you play Witcher and you're like, I really like walking around the overworld and doing quests, but I also like playing Gwent. <laughs> it's that level of just, Everything you do, you feel like it's going somewhere, it's building towards something, and at no point are you like, 
oh my god, there's so many things I can do today. I don't know what I'm gonna do, so I don't really want to make any choice. It's always like, okay, well, at least I could do a little bit of this today, and then maybe the next day I'll do this. And you build it out, and then you see it unfold, and you're like, wow, this is this is really satisfying. You know, it's paced in such a way that you know you start you start the game, and you're like, all your abilities are levels like one, and you get a question right in class, and it's like your knowledge increased, and it points to it, and it's like it doesn't increase up to two, and you're like. Okay, but like, when is it gonna increase up to two? And after like five hours, it increases up to two, and you're like, oh my god, it's gonna be like this for all these stats? And it is, and it's fine, because you can't do everything in your first playthrough. You have to make some decisions, you know, like, wow, I really wanna do this, I'm gonna spend my time doing this so I can spend some time with this person. And it makes it all that much more worth it when you're like, wow, I worked to be able to get to this point, and this is such a satisfying conclusion to this person's story and also to my personal story arc of getting to this point with my abilities or whatever. It's just really, really unique. The music is really wonderful, and it's heavily, heavily stylized, and many people have said it, and I, I will say the same thing. It does enough to make it not be just a regular JRPG. It's different enough from like the Final Fantasies and like the, uh, the Fire Emblems, I guess. I'm not really sure how those games are played, but it's got enough going to it to keep you invested in the low point too, where no point do I think it slows down in a way that makes you want to stop playing, I guess. So, I really love it. I really love the characters. I really love the music. I'm really excited for what's going to happen with it next. And I don't know. There's like very, very few issues that I have with this game. I just think it's really good. And it's really long. And for like a 100 hour, 150 hour game to be all substance, that's impressive. And they fucking nailed it. You, do you have any uh, thoughts about Persona 5? You've, I think you've seen somebody play it a couple times. I've, yeah, I've sat around. <laughs> and I think it's amazing that in, in some parts the music doesn't get annoying. Because like, I could sing you like two of the songs from the game. Yeah. Where they just play them <laughs> they all like, the time. They have like 11 total songs for the game. I don't get, I don't get how how you have that happen. It didn't It didn't bother me except for this one, like the underground song. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. And after after Rowan playing and after me playing, we're making dinner in the kitchen and we just look at each other like, <laughs> it's catchy in a good way, I yeah. think. I was gonna say I just I just got that one theme where they're always sitting around in the classroom. <laughs> I'm a shop shifter. <laughs> what else could be done? And then there's the, and then there's just the fight theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's it's always one of those things where I'm so used to those songs, I kind of miss those songs <laughs> because I was like, wow, whenever I heard these songs, I was having a good time. <laughs> I'm, I'm nostalgic over just the songs at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's powerful. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's like with Undertale, you're like singing dog song, and like, wow, yeah. dog song is fun, especially when it showed up in the game. <laughs> yeah, you're just walking around, you're just like, oh, pop, oh, pop, oh, pop. <laughs> please, I want a thousand credits so I can go to college. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, uh, my number one is basically the opposite. <laughs> Look, Persona 4, 5. Persona 5, <laughs> it's got... All this stuff and all this character and all everything is just laid out for you. So I want to do this whole thing where I wrote a statement down. I was like, nah, <laughs> you know, we have thing down. But th basically, what you should glom from what I was gonna say was around the time of 2016, the art director for Amplitude, who's also a bassist for a different band, he decided to leave Harmonics and make his own thing. He joined this other guy who was a game developer. And he, basically, he was the art director, did a lot with the music, mm -hmm. so basically it's his artistic vision, and he got one guy. Those two guys made this company that's called Drool oh, LLC, Drool. and what they did was they made one game. They probably won't make another game. <laughs> My number one game of 2018, and damn it all time, is <laughs> Thumper. Thumper is... Perfect. I cannot stop thinking about it, no matter what I do. Thumper is a rhythm violence game. It is its own genre. It is so good. They decree it as rhythm violence, and I'm with them. That's what it is. This is rhythm horror. 
<laughs> yeah, I can see that. Fuck. Oh, okay. What okay. do you do in this game? You are a beetle. You run <laughs> on a track as a total of five different obstacles come at you. Five, maybe six. There's six different things that happen. There's a little blue thing on the ground. You gotta hit it. There's yeah. lines on the ground. You gotta make sure your head's down when those come. There are lines that go above the track. You gotta make sure you fly into the lines. There are turns. Oh golly, are there turns. Sometimes you gotta make a quick turn. Sometimes you gotta hold turn. There are spikes on the ground. Or sometimes you gotta fly above the spikes. There are sometimes the bosses. They have defensive shields above them. At which you have to... Thump! That is why the game is called Thumper. You fly, and then you jump into a little blue thing, and it shoots a nice little line down, and it destroys that shield, and then you can shoot that boss in the face. I want to tell you why this game is my number one. And truly why this game is my number one is two parts. Number one, if anybody ever in their life says that video games cannot be art, <laughs> they can eat it because Thumper is art. From start to finish, it is art. Two, what I get out of the game is so much more than what the game is going for, and that is why it is my favorite game of all time. I think Thumper is an allegory for life. Wow. It is life incarnate. What happens is you are going along the line of life. Sometimes there are obstacles. Sometimes they fuck you up. And it's okay, because you just... You keep moving. There's the little bosses. They really get at you. That's like your job. It always gets at you, those bosses, but you'll defeat it. You will persevere. That's really positive. Would you like me to spoil Thumper? <laughs> because I think it's a spoiler if you want to end up playing it all the way through. Who it is in the end. So what happens is at the end, there's level, boss level Omega. Mm -hmm. And it's ahead. And first it's just, you know, it's just like, bald guy. You're like, oh, he's not too scary. By level three, he's got a lot of spikes on his head. He lo he's looking a little scarier. He keeps getting scarier as he goes. Okay. By by level seven, I think he starts to have more than two eyes. Okay. Level nine, which is the last level, he is just eyes and spikes. Oh, and he's gosh. terrifying. And you're like, oh, I finally made it. Everything's okay. You beat him, and then it does the... If you see it, it goes... And then, you know, he dies and he falls out of the way because you did it. You defeated the boss. It does that, and then he just stays in front of you. And you're like, what? What's happening? And then your little, your little beetle, he just slowly goes into his mouth. And then there's a pre-level where you're inside of him, and it's a different... It's artistically different than the rest of the game. Oh, wow. Where it's like silver inside, and it's going... And everything is moving, and it's really fast. You're like, well, man, I just dealt with all these levels. And then, at the end of the level, it starts to speed up. Holy moly. This is a rhythm music game, and then all of a sudden the tempo starts to increase. And you're like, all of a sudden you're just doing all these turns, and you're like, oh god, 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 and then you shoot out, and then it's got that ring that like yeah, yeah, yeah. does the separate, and it's moving so fast. And then you hit it, and then all of a sudden in front of you is this pyramid that's rotating. And if you notice, if you go into, and I'll talk about this in a second, because this is why this game is everything to me. You'll notice that there's this pyramid floating, and you know, you'll start to notice that at the start of every boss, that pyramid's there. Mm -hmm. It's always just there. And then all of a sudden, you've hit nine Lemniscuit, <laughs> and then you go to fight him, and he fucks with time. He throws it all out the window. He's like, you know what you've been doing this entire time? It's been stressing you out. It's been making your life a living hell. I'm throwing it out the window. You're fighting the same things, but I'll just speed and slow down time. At whatever fucking speed I want. And I'm just, I'm, I'm playing it and I'm like, ah, this is the best boss I've ever seen. It's incredible. <laughs> just, it's brought me on such a journey just to get to that point. Yeah. And then when you defeat him, he's gone. And he's destroyed, he's exploded, and then you run your little track right in the white light. I think you die. <laughs> You're dead now. You're dead. That's it. There's nothing left. That's it. There's no more to do. You've thumped until you can't thump anymore. Bummer. Thumper. It's so good. There's so many things about this game I love. <laughs> one, like so many modern gen games, you know, you always have that one blip or of a problem, and you, you're just like, ha-ha, hit the share button, something didn't function. Yeah. Nothing. 
everything works all the time. You mess something up, you messed something up. Yeah. Unless it's like the first time you're going through a level to throw something crazy hard at you that you don't know. That's when it's the game's fault. But before that, it's your fault. It's your brain. I have never felt so invested in a game where I'll get defeated and I will lose it because it hurts me that I'm bad. Other features of game. I don't think I've ever seen a game where you can let it sit on the main screen forever and it never gives you a prompt. Literally, the letters just float up, it just says thumper and you're just floating through and that angelic French horn is playing in your face. <laughs> and like, I still get chills every time I open the game. I love it so much. The music is a nightmare. <laughs> It is so stressful to see this music, or to play this game with this music, but it's the theme. Literally, you're crushing notes as you go. It's so... It is rhythm violence, and the game is stressing you out, and there's like these violin strings that are, just sounds like they're scratching their violin with their hand. <laughs> it's like, there's a vinyl of this game. And I just, the only thing I think is, why would you ever listen to this outside of the game? You yeah, like, how would that work? You would stress yourself out so hard, but I love it. You can't even listen to it outside the game, and I love it, because it's there. <laughs> and I've, like, listened to it in a class, and I remember, it was, like, before a class, yeah. where I just had my computer open, and I'm, like, listening to it, and I'm, like, sitting forward, and I'm, like, uh -huh. <laughs> That's crazy. That's awesome, though. Thumper is my number one game because nothing has made me feel this much. Nothing has made me think this much. And it's just a game where you're just a beetle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're just going forward and you're flying. And that's it. That's it. That's the whole game. It's a simple game, but it's a perfect game. That's awesome. The only problem that I've alluded is I have platinumed the game, which is great. I feel good. After that... Then there's this mode called Play Plus. And then it's like, you know, instead of being able to stop and restart a level so you can super every level, all easy, haha, you take two hits and you're dead. And nice. you have to go through the entire level. <laughs> and these levels are like 20 to 30 minutes long oh, of God. just nonsense beat you over the head so insanely hard. I mean, you watched me do a three plus on your couch. It was the yeah. whole time. If I died, that was it. That was wild. Dumb. I, I, I can't go back. I am currently in progress. I've gotten to 9, like, 16. <laughs> but every other level I have successfully gotten through. I think in total score I'm, like, 61st in the world. Damn. And I, I don't see any sign of stopping. I, I want to keep improving because, like, you can get perfect and then you improve your score. Because it's, it's a rhythm music game where you just work on multiplier or... I always try to say multiplayer. You work on multipliers. You work on multipliers, and then you can get more and more and more score. And they're just you know people who hold. It. I just I want to see my name in like one top ten, <laughs> just once. That's all I want to see. And I'm I'm gonna do it on plus. I like I know there are leaderboards for the regular, and I'm like, where's the challenge? <laughs> I don't want any of those. I want the plus records. There you go. Then put it on the big boy pants. <laughs> Anyway, um, I saw that there was a sale for Thumper, because there's never a sale for anything when I want to buy it. Um, there was a sale for Thumper for PS4 for a little bit. I'm sure that they probably knocked like six or seven bucks off of it. Yeah. It's a $20 game forever, because, I mean... It is what it is. It, it is what it is. It's just Thumper, and I, I love it to death. And so does Luna. <laughs> Alright, that's awesome. It's crazy to think about... Getting the new new personal favorite, it's, you know, wild. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, it feels good. <laughs> well, maybe you have a new personal favorite too. Who knows? That's true. Persona Five is really up there, and I know they're teasing something for March, and I'm like, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what that is. <laughs> so that's what's exciting. I did the same thing with Sunset, except they did that <laughs> DLC four years ago, <laughs> and I'm like, I'll buy the pass. Heck yeah, give it all to me, please. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all for us uh, for 2018. You have any uh, final last words? Any uh, uh, words of encouragement? Um, you know, always play what you want. Never let people stop you from playing the games you want. Yeah, that's true. And and just because we like something doesn't mean that you will or you have to. Evident with our own lists, how they compare and contrast. But 
Video games are just fun, you know? Yeah. Find one that you like, that you actually like, and doesn't make you sad or upset. Yeah. And, uh, enjoy the hell oh. out of it. Oh, man. You're right. Absolutely. Don't ever let a game continue to make you upset just because you think it's what you should be playing at the time. This is my final advertisement for Titanfall 2. Oh, God. Stop playing new Call of Duties. Stop playing Fortnite. It'll make you sad. <laughs> just play Titanfall 2. Nothing feels as good as tight. My favorite game of all time <laughs> is Titanfall 2. This video has been brought to you by Respawn Entertainment. By Respawn Entertainment. Thank you, and we'll see you in 2019. <laughs> Bye. Titanfall. Titanfall 2. <laughs> I'm out of here. He is like a mountie.